Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar series, Tedstrom Talks. This is the 17th in a series of webinars that we are producing to give our clients, business associates, friends and family, pertinent and important information on COVID-19 and other interesting and timely topics. This is also our very first webinar of 2021. Your video and microphones have been muted. However, please feel free to use the Q&A and chat icons located at the bottom of your screen to ask questions throughout the presentation. I would like to introduce you to Peter Tudstrom, founder and chief advisor of Tudstrom Wealth Advisors. Peter has 36 plus years of experience as a certified financial planner. He has been consistently recognized through awards and recognition as one of the country's top financial advisors. Peter, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to be back after a little bit of a hiatus. I think our last presentation was in October and a lot has happened since then. Um, most of what you know about and some maybe you don't, but uh, Ryan's here to help us understand what 2021 might actually look like. As we turn the page to 21, I think we all hoped and anticipated that 2021 would look a lot different from 2020. And so far, I don't think it really has. Uh, and we kicked it off with some interesting controversy politically as well. Um, Ryan is a senior vice president, chief market strategist with LPL Financial Research. Um, he does tactical asset allocation. He's responsible for directly impacting the portfolio decision-making process. As well, he's, he's a member of the Market Insights team, developing and articulating equity and general market strategy. And prior to LPL, um, Mr. Dietrich or Ryan was a senior portfolio manager at Haberer Registered Investment Advisor. Did I say that right, Ryan? Yes, Haberer. That's actually much closer than some people are when they say it. Good job. <laughs> uh, and you were managing sector asset allocation and strategies for high net worth client portfolios. Earlier in your career, you spent over a decade at Schaefer's yep. Investment Research and your research and market analysis utilized technical, fundamental and sentiment methodologies with a focus on market expectations and advanced options strategies. Um, Ryan earned his chartered market technician designation, CMT, a BS in finance from Xavier University and an MBA from Miami University. So Ryan, we're very interested in hearing how you think 2021 will, will evolve and what to expect. So thank you for being here. Uh, Peter, thank you so much for inviting me. 17th. That means it took a while to get to me, but hey, you got to me, so I'm honored. <laughs> no, but you know, it's uh, there's a lot to discuss. But first things first, let's make sure technology works. I'm going to share my screen here right now. All right, Peter, tell me, do you see this first slide? I hope. I sure do. Thank you. Good. That's always good when technology works because we've all been on the other side of that. So, so let's just get into it because I have a lot to discuss. Um, you know, we're going to take a little bit about where we were, where we've been, where we're going. I'm a big fan of The Office. Peter, you like The Office? Did you like that show, The Office? Yep, did very yeah. much. So so Andy Bernard here from The Office. I wish there was a way to know you were in the good old days before you've actually left them. That was The Office finale, Andy Bernard. And you think about it, the good old days were a year ago, all right? I mean, <laughs> who knew? You know, I mean, that's obviously a year ago right now, things are going pretty good. The economy turning around. Um, Earnings are looking good. Stocks are making all-time highs globally. Uh, yet, obviously, we all know what happened. One of the most vicious recessions we've ever seen. Global economy shuts down. Fastest 20% correction ever for stocks. Fastest 30% correction ever for stocks. Just um, you're truly amazing, but you don't really know when you've left them. Um, I love this other one by Franklin Pierce Adams. I'm talking about the good old days. Nothing is more responsible for the good old days than a bad memory. And he was a famous newspaper columnist from the Roaring Twenties. Um, this again, it's, I read some studies about how when you look back at the past, you know, you have you forget the bad times, right? I've always thought this. We went to Disney like in 2013 with three little kids, and I just remember two of them were sick. We had to go to like the the ER at Dis or nah, I guess urgent care on Disney, which was just a disaster. And it was like, I said, I hate this place, never to come back. And now I look back and actually have very fond memories of that trip eight, eight years ago. So it's amazing how 
time can change things. It's going to take a while for us to forget 2020. Um, you know, the 2020 wasn't very good. Right? There's no doubt about it. A little old lady, the husband says, if we're going to watch the news, I'll need my glasses. So little old lady gets up, gets her glasses, comes back. Double fisting. That's better. I think that's the best way to sum up 2020 right there. So Ryan Dietrich, Chief Market Strategist, LPL. Been here for five years now. Uh, my job's a lot of fun. Get to do presentations like this. I used to travel, like a lot of us. Used to get on a plane, go places, eat a good steak. You know, that was fun. Um, now I get to do webinars. But I also, I'm the guy, if you go, oh, I see you on TV. So I do get to go on TV a lot. Um, and I manage, we manage, we've got a 30-person team, manages almost 50 billion, with a B, billion dollars worth of LPL advisors and their clients' assets. And it's a, it's an honor. I um, mean, it, it's obviously very challenging. We're going to talk about kind of how we did last year. We did pretty well, honestly, last year. And we're hoping to continue things going well with some of our big calls and how we see the world but also how we manage money lost a lot of people last year regis was one i'm a big fan of regis regis said i'm involved in the stock market which is fun and sometimes very painful boy oh boy that sums up 2020 right stocks make it all-time highs on february 19th then you're sitting there um you know march 23rd six weeks later and you're down 34 percent um you know very very painful now the other thing about regis he um he was on TV for almost 17,000 hours, all-time record. Now, as a guy who gets to go on TV for like, I don't know, five or 10 minutes a week, I can tell you guys, 17,000 hours is a long time and there's a lot that can go wrong. So I want to show you some of the times I've been on TV that's been wrong. Um, what's amazing about me is if you ever see me on TV, hit pause at any time, and I'm always doing something ridiculous. Here I am on live TV playing an imaginary turntable. I turned orange here. I believe I say when I turn orange, I'm lying. So be careful the shade of my color here. I do these weird things with my hands, no idea why, but put me, I'll put a camera in front of me and there I do it. This is angry Ryan, very, very mad. This was on March 23rd, the market lows. I'm kidding, I have no idea what day it was, but that's angry Ryan there. They don't tell you when you're on TV. I know it sounds weird, they don't. I'm drinking a live drink of water with Tyler Matheson on TV. Lastly, I did a webinar from home. I think a ghost came up from behind me. So if you see me jump for some reason during this webinar, I'm not at home right now. I'm in the office in Fort Mill, South Carolina, but there I am. So enough of the goofy stuff. Let's get into it. Um, this is the first chart that I've shared a lot of different times. I shared it last year a lot. And it's pretty simple. It's what happens when you have a big year. Might might not remember this. Stocks did really, really good in 2019. Feels like 10 lifetimes ago. Stocks get over 30% in 2019. The following year, you can see there, returns 15% on average, higher 10 out of 12 times. All right, now I know there's lots of other factors, but at the same time, guys, last year, stocks gained like 16%, 17% approximately, and then were higher. So it's kind of unique when you get this momentum, it tends to resolve higher. So that's kind of an interesting way to look at things. There's a lot more things we're gonna look at. I mean, the other thing I think you think about last year, so we're gonna do a little bit of a review of last year, show where we were then about where we're going. We had a recession last year, we know that. We, we've said before, and we talked about the, the, the election, obviously Corona and the election are the two things we're gonna remember, a lot of us gonna remember about 2020 when all said and done. And recessions turns out are re-election killers. When you have a recession, the incumbent president doesn't win. If you don't have a recession, the incumbent president tends to win. It's happened every single time and even last year, you know, obviously right now, right? I mean, it worked again uh, last year. It worked every year since Calvin Coolidge in 1924 had a recession, but there was, um, uh, he won the reelection, even though there was a recession as the roaring 20s uh, took over. So kind of interesting how that played out. The other way we're gonna remember last year, just the devastation of March. This is a picture of post six from the New York Stock Exchange, uh, March, what is this, March 16th. Fourth worst, four, worst point drop ever, Dow down 3,000 points. In a percentage basis, that's like 12%. Guys, that's the fourth worst day in the history of the stock market. Crash of 29, crash of 87, and the day after stocks started trading after World War I. Only three times in 125 years did we have a worse day than March 16th. I mean, it's amazing when you look at the round tripper um, last year where stocks were down 30% and actually came all the way back to be higher. But that's one thing a lot of us are going to remember. I want to point out the fact that there's something called a secular bull market. Now, the good news, we think we're in a major secular bull market. What's a secular bull market? It's a period of higher stock prices, potentially for a decade, maybe even two. All right. Now, let's take a look at this. The shaded areas are previous um, um, secular bull markets. The first shaded area, 1950 
1968. 18 years of really solid uh, gains. You know what happened though? Seven years in, 1957, bear market and a recession. Then stocks kept going higher. Look at the, the bull market that started in 82. Everyone says the 82 bull market. I kind of disagree. I think it started in 80. Stocks gained 30% in 80 and made a new all-time high after a really horrible decade in the 70s. So from 80 to 2000, you had a major secular bull market. Seven years in, 1987, what happened? You had a major market collapse. Now, this is the seven-year itch, what I'm getting at. Seven years from 1950 and seven years from 1980, you had major market collapses. Studies show humans get tired of things after seven years, car, relationship, job. You pick it, we get tired of things after seven years. Stock markets are quite human at the end of the day. Seven years in both times, major, major pullbacks, but stocks kept going higher for years after that. Now, fast forward to the major secular bull market we're in right now. A lot of people say from 2009 to now, or 2009 is when this bull market started, right? I disagree a little bit because stocks went nowhere for 13 years, from 2000 to 2007 to 2013. When stocks broke out in 2013 from a 13-year nowhere range, that was the start of the secular bull market, in my opinion. Add seven to 2013, what do you get? 2020. Um, amazingly, we had another one of these seven-year itches with a 34% correction, just devastation out there, and we're still feeling it clearly. But if history can repeat itself, right? Um, you know, um, Churchill said, the further back into the future, into the past we look, the further into the future we can see. The past tells us seven years in, you get these pullbacks and continuation. So I want to make sure I make that very clear that we think we could have years of potentially higher prices and equities. What else do we remember about last year? Fastest bear market ever. It took 16 days to go from an all-time high to down 20%. Mark Twain said history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. Every 50 years, we've had a terrible pandemic at a bear market. Started with 1918, horrible pandemic. Millions and millions of people died. Stock market goes down 33%. 50 years later, 1968, another terrible pandemic. Million people die globally. Stocks go down 36%. Fast forward 50 more years to right now, a horrible pandemic. You know, millions of people have died. Uh, these numbers, how did I do this? So this is, these numbers are a few weeks old. These numbers are just tragically higher now, but a mid 30% correction again. Um, and again, the history doesn't repeat but it rhymes. Every 50 years of pandemic, every 50 years stocks go down mid 30%. This is a chart that we were sharing with our LPL advisors and with, with um, we got a website, lplresearch.com. I have a podcast, LPL Market Signals. We were talking about this on there back in March, all right, saying, listen, this could be, you know, there's some similarities here. We had no idea there was going to be the low and then a ra huge rally higher like it was, but it's quite interesting how things played out once again. Now, the way I'll remember last year is this. What we're showing here, the dots at the bottom are the max pullback. So the maximum the stocks pull back some point during the year. The blue, the, the shaded blue is kind of the returns, all right? All you got to know is last year, stocks are down 34%, yet finished higher. In the history of the stock market, We've never had a year where stocks were down 30% or more for the year to finish higher until last year. The only year that was kind of similar was 2009. Stocks were down 27% early in the year and then finished up over about 20% or so. You think about that time period, that was, um, you know, looking back, what happened in 2009 kicked off a really good economic, a really good uh, continued bull market. We see some similarities there. So just be aware of that. Um, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? John Maynard Keynes. I love that quote. And, you know, as stewards of assets, we did not predict the recession this year, last year. We did not predict the major bear market this year. We, if you'd seen me a year ago, I would have said stocks would probably gain 10 to 12 percent. Earnings would do well, economy do well. Well, earnings did very poorly. <laughs> Economy did very poorly, yet stocks actually gained double digits in a lot of cases and even more in some cases. Um, but what happened 15 days off the lows is right here. We had the greatest 15 day rally in the history of the stock market off of those lows on March 23rd. And that's what we're showing here. And what is it? Look at where it says six months later and 12 months later after the previous greatest three month, three week rallies ever. 
really strong outperformance. These are things that we were looking at and talking about internally and externally at LPL Research. Guys, we upgraded our view on equities on March 26th at LPL Research. And a lot of the assets and the, 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 the uh, models and portfolios we run for, for our advisors and for their clients, we started adding some equity risk. A lot of our peers and competitors were downgrading their view on equities on March 26th after the devastation. We saw a lot of negative things out there, but we said, you know, it's such, it's just so much negativity. If you get any good news at all, we could be ripe for a bounce. And then you see something like this, and it's the market's way of telling us what happened in the past says higher prices are likely. And fortunately, that's exactly what played out. Now, as a big fan of Anchorman, I say you have to have an Anchorman quote in every presentation, um, Brian Fantana. They've done studies, you know, 60% of the time, it works every time. I just threw out a lot of numbers and a lot of statistics there. The truth of the matter is, though, um, you know, what happened last year was devastating. It was also record-breaking in a lot of ways. The good news is we see some really positive things happening on the economic front and continued from investments point of view. And that's what we're going to start focusing on now. Outlook 2021 powering forward with the help of our marketing and communications team. We put this really cool looking um, uh, uh, outlook together. It's as you can see, it's powering forward, right? We have no other choice. I mean, we just had an economy that hit a tree, right? The economy hit a tree and stopped. Now we're starting things back up. We don't know what it's going to be like. We got to fix some things. We got to get the machines out and fix it and the tools out. And that's kind of this neat theme I think that we have with uh, powering forward with the car theme. Um, and, and, you know, I like to start with this. Let's start with policy. I said I've done this for over 22 years. I, when I first started, I never talked about policy, whether it be the Fed or fiscal policy. I didn't talk about that stuff. Now I start my presentations with it because it's such a big part of it. Obviously, it's going on tomorrow. We're going to talk a little bit about that with the, with the new power in the White House, what it all could mean. Um, but the first thing, we've had a lot of questions over the past few weeks with the surprise election out of Georgia. What does a blue wave mean? And to be honest, we've had some concerns. People say, okay, there's a blue wave, higher taxes, higher regulation. It's going to hurt my investments. It's going to hurt the economy. Guys, the truth, and you can see the chart here, this is what stocks have done under previous blue waves. Doesn't look too bad to me. Up 9% on average, up about 78% of the time. That's kind of your average year. Stocks only been down once, going back to the late 70s, when you have a blue wave. So just kind of be aware of that. Also, here's a different look at it. Similar look, but different. This is every Democratic president since 1900, all right? Now, what's really interesting, check out the House and Senate. See that D next to both of them? Every single Democratic president that won the election for the first year, so this is re-election, this is year one in the White House, brought the House and Senate with them. It would be even more, a little more rare if had Joe Biden not brought the Senate with them, okay? But what's really fascinating is look at where it says House majority. The Democrats actually lost seats in the House, right? The Senate's 50-50. We know that it's split right down the middle with Madam Vice President, the tiebreaker, so Democrats control the Senate. But the House is a 11 seat majority. That's the smallest majority the Democrats have had since 1879. You got to go back a long time the last time we had that small of a majority. Um, so the reason, one of the reasons the stock market had a huge rally in November and December last year was because, you know, there's all this talk of a major blue wave and potentially much higher taxes, much more regulation. Whether you agree with it or you don't, the stock market was a little worried about it. And that didn't happen. Then we had a major rally to end the year because there's old saying gridlock is good. After the election, most people assumed the Republicans would probably take both those seats in Georgia, actually. And as time went on, it became clear that maybe they're not. And then the vote happened, obviously. Uh, the runoffs happened, and that wasn't the case at all. But still, with just an 11-seat majority, stock market's okay with that because, there's again, gridlock can be good. When you have checks and balances in Washington, that's actually a good thing, not too much power one way or the other. Um, that's a, a good thing. So look at the next year, though, the first year of a new president, the returns there on the right. Pretty solid, if you ask me, up 12% on average, higher three out of four times. So again, if you, if you potentially are concerned about a blue wave, these are some things that hopefully can help calm some of those fears. Now, policy, you can't talk about policy without bringing in the Fed. Jerome Powell's in charge of the Fed. He's not your father's Fed, is what I like to say. Um, He's been on 60 Minutes like three times the last 18 months. That's pretty unheard of for a Fed chairperson. But I want to keep this fairly simple. Jerome Powell on March 23rd, and remember, we upgraded our view in equities three days later. It's not a coincidence. The Fed came out and said, that's it. We're going to backstop everything. Guys, the Fed is literally buying junk bond ETFs. I never thought I'd say that in my life, but I just said it, and it's happening. 
Um, so it's really amazing all the different levers the Fed is pulling. But there's also an old saying, don't fight the Fed. And that was one of the big reasons we upgraded our view on equities on March 23rd when a lot of other people were very fearful. Not that we weren't fearful, trust me, that was really a scary, historically scary time. But we also saw some positives with the Fed out there to, you know, I say it's like this, you hold a, a, um, a, um, a beach ball under the water really, really far, then you let go. Once that starts going up, man, good luck catching it, right? That beach ball's flying. And that's kind of what happened with the stock market. Once the Fed kind of lit the wick, things started bouncing significantly. And the Fed is still there. So don't fight the Fed is a really important saying that can continue to um, be in everyone's play this year. Also, maybe we're not as divided as we think we are. Let's hope, let's hope we're not, right? Um, there's McConnell and Vice President-elect Biden. Well, it turns out they're friends. You can actually, it turns out you can actually be friends with somebody in Washington from the left or the right. These are two lifetime senators. Now, I know, you know, Joe Biden was a vice president for eight years. And I know that starting tomorrow, he'll be the next vice, the next president, 46th president of the United States. Um, but they're friends, right? They are lifetime senators. They understand how to get things done in Washington. And President Trump was never a senator. President Obama was a senator for like a minute. He had bigger, better aspirations, and, and it worked out pretty well. But these two are a little different, I think. And they're all obviously both a little more moderate, too. Um, so, you know, one other thing is when um, Joe Biden's son passed away, McConnell was the only Republican senator that went to the funeral. So just things to remember, maybe they can actually get some things done behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, in front of everybody, whatever you want to call it to get a little bit more normalcy and working together in Washington, or wouldn't that be a nice change? Now, believe me, hope is not a strategy. So we don't invest on hope, but we are optimistic that um, you know these two old friends can get some get something done here. Let's talk about the economy, a new start. I love this one. See the key, got the LPL symbol on it there. I think that's pretty cool. Vaccines are here. We have two vaccines with 95% effective rates right now. There are two more vaccines likely, according to Fauci, within the next couple of weeks, probably. Uh, the AstraZeneca one and, huh, I just went blank on the other one. AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, Johnson & Johnson one. The cool one about the Johnson & Johnson one, by the way, it's only one shot and you don't need those super freezers that some of these other vaccines do. It's got a lower effective rate in all likelihood, but the good news is, you know, again, easier to transport, easier to use. In April or May, if we were to talk to, if you would have had um, one of the top scientists on, COVID experts, vaccine experts, they would have said, you know what, if by the end of the year, if we have a vaccine that's 70% effective, we'd almost consider that a miracle, all right? Guys, we've got two vaccines that were in people's arms by the end of the year at a 95% effective rate. That's like mumps and measles, okay? 95% effective, you just wipe it off the earth. Thank goodness. Um, now, we know there's been a lot of issues with getting out, right, getting get it in people's arms. But the bottom line is you got to thank the scientists and, and, and just the, the drug companies are able to just do amazing, amazing things. And um, that's a positive to opening up the, you've all heard, you're talking on CNBC, you can't go five minutes out, I'm saying open up the economy, open up the economy. I've probably, you've probably heard me on there say the same thing, but it's the truth. And that's where we're coming. By the way, open up the economy. It's my wife and I's 15th year anniversary this uh, October. So assuming I don't screw it up and we get there, I feel like I will, but you never know. Um, you know, we're going to the Dominican Republic this October. It felt really good, kind of cathartic, if you will, to like go online and order something, you know, something like that. So this October, cross our fingers, get to do something like that. And hopefully everybody listening to this gets to do some really cool trip after uh, kind of the rough, uh, rough, rough year we've all gone through. It's not what you look at, it's what you see. Henry David Thoreau, what do you see? Well, here's what I see. These are all the previous economic cycles of growth going back to World War II, all right? What's really fascinating about it though is the average growth is about five years. This new cycle of growth that just started is we think it started in the summer, but there's no official date yet when the expansion started, but let's say it's six months old. There could be a long time of economic growth to come. And that's something I think is really, really important for people to realize. I know we've had a huge bounce in stocks. We'll talk about stocks soon here. But from an economic point of view, this economy is just starting to get going again. All right. That's really, really potentially a powerful, powerful thing. And be on the lookout for potentially years of economic growth if you look back at history. You might have heard about a K-shaped recovery. Everyone talks about the shape of their recovery, V, U, W. Well, K makes a lot of sense to us. And what's a K do? Part of it goes up, part of it goes down. The truth is this is a divided, um, you say country, <laughs> divided Washington, but divided economy. Look at the chart now. This is based on income. If you made more than $60,000, your unemployment rate went down. 
If you made less than $27,000 and likely in the hard hit services area, your unemployment rate soared. So that's what that's the K-shaped recovery. I mean, a company like um, Live Nation, they do uh, concerts, right? Have you ever seen a concert? Odds are the ticket says Live Nation on it. Their revenue was down 98% the second quarter. I mean, I was like, where'd they get to 2%? I don't know who's doing too many concerts back in the second quarter. Um, you know, Dave and Buster's, you know, uh, indoor, you know, eating and games. Their revenue is down like 95% the second quarter. That's the part that went down. And then you've got other parts that are just soaring. You know, Amazon is just growing leaps and bounds, paying, you know, 100,000. Like, I think it's, I forget the exact number. I think it was like, they're going to hire like 50,000 people at $130,000 a year in the midst of all the second quarter stuff because they're growing. So that's the K-shaped recovery. Some parts are doing well, some parts aren't. The good news with the vaccines and likely reopening happening in the second half of this year, if not a tad earlier, we can get a real good bounce back um, from the part that was so, so hurt. And that's a, what's important is this whole um, next fiscal plan that's, you know, it, it's coming, right? It's coming. We have to help the people that are impacted by these by this. I mean, uh, and, and, and and the truth is, yes, we're adding more debt and we're going to do Q&A at the end. And I know, you know, someone's going to ask about all the debt that's out there. And we can talk about that then. But the truth is we have to help, you know, the K part that went down. And, um, you know, it's, there's no easy answer. There is absolutely no easy answer. Um, but it's not me who can't keep a secret. It's the people I tell who can't. Honest Abe Lincoln. I love, I love that one. Well, here's the secret, guys. The amount of fiscal stimulus we have in the system uh, this year, or let's say the last six months or so, is off the charts. This is a chart from our friends at Ned Davis Research. All you got to know, the blue, that's now. That's the fiscal stimulus now. The orange was then the, the um, great financial crisis. There's been so much incredible stimulus that's put into the system. And I get oh, probably some of your concerns. You know, are we just inflating ourselves to death? We're gonna have massive inflation down the road. Um, you know, why does the Fed of this endless power, why does the president pick who's in charge of the Fed? Why can't we audit the Fed? I, I can't disagree with a lot, of, with a lot of those things. But what I do know is this, stock markets like fiscal stimulus, okay? And we've had a lot of it. Stock markets like spending. We've got a lot more spending coming. So from an investments point of view, you have to separate, you know, what's going on here with, with your investments. And these are still tailwinds for investments. Uh, what's one thing, one other thing I want to touch on. See that one on the right, the blue way up there? That's Japan. The amount of stimulus we've seen out of Japan is almost literally off the charts. And we have grown significantly more bullish on Japan. We like the United States. And we're going to talk about all this stuff in a minute. We like the United States. We don't like Europe as much, but we like Japan potentially uh, for, 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 a, um, for, for an investment over the next couple of years. So here's our overall forecast. So we had to put these together like back in October, um, you know, when we released our outlook in early November, uh, early December, I'm sorry, but we had to put it together late October. Um, bottom line, U.S. growth, maybe 4% this year. Um, you can see we see more growth coming out of emerging markets. I think um, South Korea, Taiwan, um, you know, um, China. Uh, inflation, um, personally, I think I'm a little more worried about inflation about a year from now or so than some other people in our department, but that's okay. We all don't want to have groupthink. Um, I do see a lot of stimulus that's out there, and the Fed has said they're going to, you know, <laughs> likely not hike rates for a couple of years. So maybe we could have a little more inflation a year or two down the road. We're not there yet, though. Uh, but the, most of the growth globally is coming from emerging markets. Let's talk about earnings, um, or sorry, stocks. Earnings rebound may spark 2021 gains. I like that. That's pretty good. Um, oh, here's another way to sum up 2020. Where does it hurt? There's a headache. There's a stomach ache. And there's 2020. It hurts all over. Um, Neil Ferguson, a historian, said, the dead outnumber the living 14 to 1. Ignore such accumulated experience at your peril. I, again, I think if you get the gist of how I look at the world, I like to see what happened in the past to give a clue where we could go. And I get every time is different. We've never had a pandemic like this. We've never shut the economy down like this. We've never had a Fed expand the balance sheet like we have. So these times are different. But what happened also late last year? Huge rally. And I talked about it a second ago. I guess I've got a pointer here. Hopefully you can see this. Um, the last two months of 2020, the S&P gained almost 15%. That was the greatest two-month rally in the history of the stock market to end a year. 
I mean, 2020 was just the craziest year ever. And then you have the biggest end of year rally ever in 2020. And again, why did it happen? I talked about it a little bit. We didn't have a massive blue wave like some, some people were fearful of. There was a lot of gridlock and, and checks and balances, which is a good thing from a, uh, a lot of time from a policy point of view. Also, someone named Janet Yellen. That name might, might ring a bell. She's getting um, sworn in. I think it's tomorrow. Janet Yellen was in charge of the Fed. Now she's in charge of the Treasury. Someone could say, well, there's the Fed and Treasury. That's kind of like, you know, church and state. Shouldn't they be separated? I don't think it's the case anymore. They're not separated anymore and they're putting them together. But when she came out in November in charge of the Treasury, that coupled with the election that came and the good news on the um, on the vaccine front, all those things took place to spark a huge rally. What happens next is what matters. Check it out. January, never been lower when you have at least a 10% gain the final two months of the year. We're, we're halfway through January and you know, it's looking like I have another gain. My lights are turning off. I got to wave my hand here. There we go. Gotta, anyway, there we go. Um, the following year, higher every single time, up 18% average after a historically strong end of year rally. So just something to be aware of. Um, we're going to have a pullback eventually. Actually, the next slide, I'll talk about that. Um, what's fascinating about this bull market was it was tracking the 2009 bull market and 1982 bull market almost to a T. And that's what I'm showing you here. The dark blue is now. Then the other two of those two previous really strong best starts the bull markets ever. We've shared this chart a lot in the last six, seven, eight months or so. Um, probably more like six, probably more like five or six months, I should say. But saying, listen, we're following these previous major bull markets. Maybe we can continue to have strength. But what's really interesting is right about now, those two previous times after a 70% rally in stocks, what happened? Things were choppy for the next six, seven months. Honestly, guys, after a 70% rally in stocks, if you're bullish, one of the best things could be choppiness. Let the market catch its breath. We don't want to have a blow off top. Let it catch its breath. That'd be totally fine. In fact, think about this. In 2010, early 2010, I had a 10% correction in, early in the year. And stocks went right back to new highs. 16% correction in the summer months in, in 2010. And then again, we went back to new highs. Um, I wouldn't be shocked at all if something like that happened again. After a 70% rally, a 10% correction, new highs, 16% correction, new highs. Uh, that could play out. And again, that, just kind of be aware when the market pulls back, you're going to call Peter, you're going to be worried, you're going to wonder what's going on. Um, just remember, a 70% rally, a little break is perfectly normal in the whole scope and scheme of things. So people say, what, what's your target? And I hate targets. I'm a strategist, but I hate targets. Our target on the S&P is 3,900. As of right now, I think the S&P is at 3,800. Um, so yes, that's right there. Remember though, we kind of had to come up with this. Then we had that huge end of year rally. So we didn't really equate for that. Um, but the best way to put it is this. We manage a lot of money. Just because stocks are getting close to our target does not mean we're saying sell. It does not mean we're saying get out of stocks and you know buy cash or do this. We, we think this is a major bull market that has life left. The way we're looking at it is we think there's going to be some type of a pretty significant pullback. Now, significant, this might be a strong word, 10 or 15% correction, which would be perfectly normal, which we'll use to add to some, uh, to some um, risk assets, specifically stocks. So yes, we are right near our fair value target. Honestly, we'd probably upgrade up our fair value target here um, sometime, maybe in the second quarter or so. Um, but still, we think it's a major bull market. We think earnings are about maybe 20% or so for the year. At the time we did this, it might even be a little bit better now. We've had stronger earnings lately. And uh, yields, we'll talk about yields here in a second as we wrap things up. So small caps are a group that we like, and this is a, a cool chart that shows small caps do great when the economy leaves a recession, when it starts a new expansion. We like large caps a lot. Now we're kind of a little more even with small caps and large caps. Um, we think there's a lot of potential there uh, from small caps as this new economic cycle of growth continues. People always talk about growth or value. You know, who you got? Growth or value. Well, we liked growth a lot last year. I mean, that did really well. We were positioned nicely in a lot of our models because we liked growth and growth stocks did a lot better in value stocks last year. We're starting to get a little more even up on them. Um, we think, you know, with the more stimulus coming, with the likely higher 10-year yield, which I'll talk about uh, during the bond section here soon, that can help value stocks. So we think there's some potential there. Also, small caps underperform big time. All right, now we're getting small caps doing better, value stocks doing better, financials doing a little bit better. Those are some groups, again, that we didn't like all that much. We warmed to as we head into 2021. 
My son, Gus, is uh, he was seven at the time. He's eight now. And actually, he's got a basketball game. I, I coach a basketball team. We've got a game here in about, I don't know, two hours, 530. What time is it? Actually, an hour. OK, we've got a game in an hour. <laughs> um, you know, you're ready. Anyway, we're, 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 we're undefeated. We're the one seed playing the four seed in a tournament. So um, that'll be fun. Anyway, so Gus um, looked up one day and said, Daddy, you see that guy? And I'm like, what's he talking about? Like that guy, that's KFC. I, I don't know. I guess you guys are out west. I don't know. Do you guys have Kentucky Fried Chicken out there, Peter? You, you know what I'm talking about? You want to nod or a thumbs up? Yeah, we know. We sure do. Okay, good. So grew up in Ohio. <laughs> that's right next to Kentucky. I ate a lot of Kentucky Fried Chicken. My dad's day off was Monday night. There's so many times when I was a little kid, we'd go get a bucket of chicken, go to the park and do some stuff and eat some chicken. So I grew up eating Kentucky Fried Chicken. So anyway, down here in Charlotte, driving off my son, Gus, he goes, Daddy, you see that guy? And I'm like, what's he talking about? He goes, that guy. Goes, oh, yeah, the colonel. I see him. He goes, why is his body so small? <laughs> I'm like, oh, my goodness. I'm like 42 years old. My whole life, I thought he just wearing a goofy tie, you know. And anyway, so it's amazing, like, how a seven-year-old can see things. And we all get the same information. Yet we all come to wildly different conclusions. And Gus did it looking at the colonel there. And you think about it, what's one thing we all can likely agree on this year? I, you should say next year, but this year, 2021, earnings, growth. It's coming back. Um, you can see it here. We had an earnings recession last year, earnings recession in 2019 in a lot of parts of the world. Massive earnings growth. And honestly, that's just 21.7 for the United States. We wouldn't be shocked at all if the U.S. had almost 25% earnings growth this year. Some of the economic data continues to get better. But it's not just a U.S. story. It's a global theme of a global earnings um, expansion. And guys, just to keep this real simple, when you have earnings growth like that, you don't have recessions. When you don't have recessions, you likely don't have bear markets. Doesn't mean you can't have a big pullback. Doesn't mean you can't be scary. But again, use it as an opportunity likely for longer-term investments and for, to hit your longer-term financial goals. Got to hand it to our friends in Japan. They figured out how to get rid of bears. And as market people, we don't like bears. And check this out. Japanese town deploys growling wolf monster, or monster wolf, sorry, robots to scare away wild bears. Well. How about that? Now, what in the world does that do with anything? Well, check out Japan. Remember I mentioned um, we like the United States. We don't like Europe quite as much, but from a developed point of view, Japan went nowhere for 30 years. I know a lot of you are going to say, listen, stocks are up a lot. They're overvalued. They've gone up. That's all tech stocks. I mean, tech stocks have gone up a lot. Communication stocks have gone up a lot. Small caps just broke out for the first time late last year after going nowhere for two and a half years. All right. Japan's gone nowhere for three decades. And now they're starting to break out. So this is one area with um, some new leadership there, uh, some, some massive fiscal stimulus, as I showed on that chart earlier. We think Japan is one area that could be a little bit of a wild card for some strong outperformance as we head into, uh, really, honestly, the next several years. Most overnight success stories took a long time. Steve Jobs. This is a picture of emerging markets. Guys, all you got to know, emerging markets have literally gone nowhere for 13 years. That's a terrible investment. We got an investment that goes nowhere for 13 years. That's, that's not good, right? That's, that's unfortunate. But the good news, the flip side of this, it's gone nowhere for 13 years. It's finally starting to move. Remember I mentioned from 2000 to 2013, what the S&P 500 do? Went nowhere. Then it started to move. We look at emerging markets finally breaking out. We really like emerging markets here uh, for some solid growth, some good valuations, um, and we think it can do. It could be a really nice place in, 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 the, in the right portfolios. Please talk to Peter before you make any decisions there. But you know, emerging markets are an area we definitely have warmed to a lot last year and late last year. They did well, and we think this year uh, they can continue to do well. Places like Taiwan and, um, and Hong Kong and South Korea. Oh my goodness, their stock markets are really doing well as they've kind of. I'm not going to say beat COVID, but they've got, they're have got they definitely ahead of us as it pertains to COVID. And there's some real positive things that are taking place in those places. A couple more charts, we're going to wrap it up. Um, the dollar is weak. Keep this real simple. The U.S. dollar has been very weak lately. Um, you can see we had a big spike in March, but it's rolled over. We've got a very dovish Fed. We've got, um, you know, there's a lot of different policy plays that are in play. A lot of Joe Biden's policies, higher taxes, a little bit more regulation. Those are a little bit weak U.S. dollar. So we've been dollar bears, if you will. Historically speaking, a weak dollar is a tailwind for global investments. We think specifically emerging markets. So we think a little bit weaker dollar makes sense this year. And that should continue to benefit emerging markets. Last one on this and a couple things on bonds. And we're doing some Q&A. Don't ignore the reaction. Guys, the reaction around the election was unheard of. 
four days in a row, the S&P gained 1% or more. Monday before the election, it was up over 1%. Tuesday, day of election, up over 1%. Day after the election, up over 1%. Thursday, up over 1%. You know how rare that is? On the screen, I'm showing you. 82, 74, and 70. That's it. That's the only other times we had a four-day, every single day of 1% or more for stocks. Check out six months later and 12 months later. Extremely strong outperformance. We were talking about this literally four days after the election, okay? We were talking about these saying, listen, this could be bullish. This could be really strong. And sure enough, looking back, it's really played out. But just kind of be aware of the, what the market did around the election, whether you like the results or you don't like the results. That's not what really matters to investors. I mean, I, I hate to be like that, but it's the reaction that matters for investments. And this is the stuff that we've been following at LPL Research. And we think the reaction is so, so very powerful and likely means, you know, continued higher prices for stocks. Let's talk about bonds for a minute and we're going to wrap it up. Staying in their lane, we think stocks outperform bonds again. We think the 10 year yield will go a little bit higher this year, up between uh, one and a quarter and 175. It doesn't sound that high, but 10 year yield was down around 40 basis points back in March. So it's going higher. Um, and again, we're underweight bonds in general. We think stocks will do a little bit better. We felt that way last year, feel this way again this year. Um, don't want to get too geeky on you here, but we're shortening up our duration. If you buy treasuries, longer term things, they get hurt a little bit more by higher, higher yields. So we're shortening up our duration. We like higher credit. We like investment grade. Uh, we also like mortgage-backed securities. Should uh, rates continue to go higher, yields continue to go higher, mortgage-backed securities are not as impacted by that, and that can be a potential... Um, a nice potential area uh, for fixed income. Now, Peter Bernstein told us this, diversification is the only rational deployment of our ignorance. It makes sense to stay diversified. I mean, just because, you know, stocks are up a lot and bonds did okay last year. How'd you feel in March? <laughs> stocks are getting killed. Your bonds did pretty good, right? I mean, it, sometimes it's nice to sleep at night. Um, you know, that's important to remember. Uh, but this is a cool chart. The large decline in the 10-year yield, we saw a huge drop in the 10-year yield. Now, remember, Yields and bond prices are inversely related. So when yields go down, bond prices go up and vice versa. And all we're showing here, we shared this in our outlook, when you have a big drop in the 10 year yield, it tends to bounce. This isn't rocket science sometimes. <laughs> and that's exactly what's been happening. They had a huge drop and now we're starting to bounce. Now you've got the fiscal stimulus coming uh, you know, with, with, the, with the, the, the blue wave and that's likely moving rates higher as well. Um, so, so this is one reason we thought higher rates could come also uh, copper, copper is at an eight year high. Historically, copper is kind of like how goes copper goes, goes the global economy. It's a good thing. And copper doing well like this tends to pull rates higher as well. And this is another reason why we kind of need to continue yield to go higher, um, likely this year when all is said and done. I think this might be the last chart. Uh, high quality bonds have done, how I word it here, high quality bonds have held up well. Um, held up during equity market declines. All we're showing here is the last couple of times stocks got hit pretty hard, you know, going back to 2010. And I'll show here, you can see my pointer. Those are the big declines we saw. Well, there it is, 34% during the bear market of last year. Now, bonds didn't do that great. They were actually still down 1%. Um, so it's not spectacular, but hey, it's better if you had a, you know, 60-40 portfolio, 60% stocks, 40% bonds. Hey, 40% down 1% feels a lot better than the whole thing down 34. But you can see for the most part, bonds do their job. When we have these big market corrections historically, you're going to get some uh, safety from the Barclays Ag, that's your average bond. And then treasuries are the longer term um, of the curve and treasuries tend to do well. So just important to remember, there's always a place for bonds in a, in a, in a portfolio. We just think again, this year, stocks likely continue to outperform bonds. The journey continues, We've got a long way to go. We see, I've hopefully I laid out the, the base case. We see a lot of positives. I, personally, I'm a little concerned. We have had a huge rally. I, a lot of people are optimistic. A lot of people are excited. It's great, it's a lot different than back in March. Markets don't like when the, all the masses agree though. So I think maybe we got a little upset the apple cart here sometime in the first quarter, but believe me, we would use an opportunity uh, to buy uh, some assets here. A uh, good riddance of 2020, it was such a rough year. Santa Claus tested positive. The doctor asked Santa Claus, I need a list of everywhere you've been. <laughs> That's rough on a guy like Santa. He's been a lot of places. Uh, last one, enjoy the moment. Uh, there's my dad. My kids went to Xavier University, Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, that's when we beat Villanova. They're number one in the country back, uh, I guess it's 2016. Uh, my dad passed away three years ago last week on January 13th. So, you know, let's hope the bond, bond starts hurt. Let's hope the economy keeps going. Let's hope the bull market keeps going. Let's hope bonds do well. You know, if you got some money in gold, let's hope that does well. Let's hope all this stuff keeps going well. 
But without our health, let's hope we crush COVID. Let's be should have started with that, honestly. Um, but without our health, none of this stuff matters. So from everyone at LPL Research and for myself, you know, we wish everyone a lucrative, hopefully, a year, but let's stay healthy and, and, and love each other out there before we do anything else. So thank you. That's my presentation, Peter. I got to show a few more slides, keep the lawyers happy. You know how those lawyers can be. And let's do some Q&A. Awesome, Ryan. Thank you. Uh, by the way, let's spend a, a, what, a half hour on those disclosures or can we go by those quickly? Want me to read them <laughs> word for word? Yes. <laughs> we right, might there. lose a few of our participants. Um, thank yeah. you so much, Ryan. Great message. Love the quotes and all the pictures. Um, I don't see any questions and answer or questions from the audience yet, but I have a handful. And Oh, yeah, anyhow. fire away. Yeah, any of you who are out there that do have questions, the best way to do is go to the Q&A button at the very bottom of your screen, type in your question while I'm asking Ryan and he's responding. Um, you mentioned gold and that's been on my yep. mind. I've got clients that have asked about gold. Uh, we've got clients that have bought gold. I've got two questions. One, what do you think about owning gold right now? And if so, how should we own it? Mm -hmm. No, excellent question. We like gold. Um, you know, I mentioned the U.S. dollar, how we have, a, we think, a weakish U.S. dollar. Keep it real simple. The dollar and gold historically been inversely related. Uh, we upgraded our view on gold, Peter, I think around, oh, gee, September of last year. So almost about 15, 16 months ago. We, we see some positive things happening. Now, I'm not a gold bug. You know, gold bug is someone who thinks gold's going to go to $10,000. Um, you know, but we think, you know, the dollar is weak. Uh, gold's a nice diversifier. And honestly, the way we have gold and some of the models that we do, we're keeping it real simple again. We're just sticking with GLD, right? That's the large ETF that you can own, um, you know, physical gold in ETF form. Um, you could own some of the gold miner ETFs as well, but we, you know, it depends how aggressive you want to get. And also you talk about gold, silver is another one. I mentioned industrial metals and base metals being strong. Silver is kind of, you know, kind of that way, but it's also a precious metal. Silver is another one that we think looks really good here. And actually in some of the models that we run, we have SLV, that is the silver ETF. So both of those um, are nice plays and I get it. You know, one of the reasons that could do well, well, there's like 17 trillion with a T dollars worth of sovereign glo global debt around the globe with negative yields, all right? So stuff's not making any money. So you might want the stuff that has the saying go, if you drop it and hit your foot, it hurts, right? That, that's the stuff you want to own. And then gold is one of those things, if you drop it and hit your foot, it's probably going to hurt. So again, in the right portfolio, you know, you got to, we wouldn't go overboard, but you know, having a little bit of allocation to gold and maybe even a tad of silver makes sense to us as we head into the future here. Excellent. Thank you. Got a question uh, from the audience. Do you have preference for short or longer term bond maturities? Yeah, great question. Uh, let's see. Okay. Yeah, Carter. Thank you, Carter. Um, shorter term. And again, the rationale is we think the 10 year yield is going to continue to go higher. And it's 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 all relative. I think 10 year yields like 1.1%, something like that doesn't sound high at all. But it was higher than it was six months ago. Um, and again, if the 10 year yield goes up to say 175, which is our base case, we think a year from now, we think 10 year yield will be around 175. That'll impact your bonds and it'll, it'll hurt your longer term maturity bonds more as again, they're more sensitive to any changes in rates. Um, so that's just an important way to look at it. Um, but yeah, we, and again, we're sticking with a little higher quality. Now, I will say this. For the first time in five years being here, we've actually warmed a little bit to junk bonds and emerging market debt. We haven't really liked those for the five years that I've been here, but in a low, low yield world, you can get a little bit more yield there. And if the economy kind of does a little bit better, like we think it could next year, um, you know, kind of high yield or junk bonds, if you will, could do a little bit better. But to answer the question, we would absolutely say shorten your maturity on some of your bond holdings. And uh, we're, we're underweight treasuries here. As again, we think treasuries since March 23rd, as a piece of 60 percent, 70 percent, treasuries are down right now. Believe me, <laughs> if they pull back, that might be a different side. And believe me, I cherry picked that date for a reason. But still, um, if, if yields keep going higher, uh, you know, treasuries might not will likely not quite do as well. Very good. Now we got a question from Pat, and it's the same yeah. question I know we've yeah. gotten bunch of times from my clients oh and, uh, uh, after trouble. gold is what ha what about bitcoin yeah sadly i am not allowed to talk about bitcoin pat and i'm, I'm sorry about that that's just that's a compliance thing what i can say though i, I kind of you know are we re are we recording this <laughs> I'll, I'll say this much blockchain in general i can talk about blockchain We've been optimistic blockchain for several years at LPL Research. We think there's so much potential there. We actually made some SMAs, um, you know, the people, the, the top companies that actually invest in the blockchain and blockchain technology. So we think there's a lot of potential there. But, you know, you think about 
Bitcoin and, 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 and the cryptocurrencies, which again, I'm not talking about, just talking broadly. Look at all the IPOs that are happening, okay? There are some bubblicious things, I think is what I would say taking place. I mean, some of these IPOs that are coming out, yes, they're quote unquote making money, but at the same time, there's a lot of excitement. And a lot of money sloshing around out there when you look at some of these things that have gone up a ton lately. And that contrarian in me starts to worry a little bit that, okay, maybe it could be a little bit time for a break here when I start to see some of these things um, you know, taking place. Not the end of the bull market, make that very, very clear, but just maybe a little bit of a break. Um, but in general, when it comes to those cryptocurrencies, can't see anything, but LPL in general likes blockchain and the, 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 the um, you know, potential, I guess we could say, for that group. Excellent. Um if there are any more questions, let me know and put them up on the Q&A. But while we're still chatting, Ryan, what about, you talked about emerging markets and being somewhat bullish on those. Yep. Any particular emerging market or area? Yeah. Yes, the Asian emerging markets. We don't like Central American quite as much or the Middle Eastern quite as much. I mean, we look at the Asian markets, again, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong, some of those that are really uh, doing well. And they are quite linked to semiconductors. What's unique about semiconductors, I've just seen some reports this week or the last week that there's a shortage in semiconductors. Well, I'm not that smart, but I know supply and demand. If there's not as much demand, or I'm sorry, not as much supply, but demand is high, the price goes up. Look at what semiconductor stocks have been doing. I think they're up another 2% today or almost 3% today. That's a big group that we've been bullish on for a while, semiconductors. That's a big part of Hong Kong, South Korea, Taiwan. I mean, Taiwan, the Taiwanese semiconductor, right? They make a lot of semiconductors. So that's a group um, that is very influential, but it's doing well. So we, we like the Asian ones. And, I, and I'll tell you, China is still an emerging market. I don't know how, believe me, I don't think they should be. And I think a lot of people agree there, but it is what it is. China makes up 40% of emerging markets when you look at kind of the investment breakdown. Um, you know, I don't trust Chinese data like the next guy, but I do trust what Hyatt's saying. Hyatt's saying China is more full now than they were in September in terms of their hotels. I mean, there's a lot of growth that's taking place in China. I saw, uh, I didn't read the article. I saw the headline over the weekend. China was the only country in the entire world that had positive or, uh, GDP last, last year. Again, do we trust Chinese data? I don't know, but you know, still, there's some positive things happening in China. And I get a lot of the negative things that are taking place in China. I don't want to, I don't, I'm, I mean, I'm trying to separate, you know, some, some things here from a purely investments point of view. Um, but there are, we, we think China can be a big cog of global growth. And that's another part of why we like emerging markets, not just again, not just this year, but for years. Oh, real fast, Peter, on the dollar. So that's kind of all plays in. The dollar has these big cycles, all right? If you go back in 1985, the dollar had a major peak. 16 years later, 2001, dollar had a major peak. 16 years later, 2017, dollar had a major peak. Those lows last for about eight years. What I'm getting at, these major cyclical turns of event that take place in the commodity indices, specific, I'm sorry, in the currencies like the dollar, the US dollar very well could go lower till 2023, 2024, just looking at these big cycles that we've been seeing, these 16 year cycles. And again, that should benefit emerging markets in all likelihood. Excellent. Thank yep. you. So yeah. I do hear a lot of people talk about the P.E. ratio and the P.E. Yes, ratio. Yes, yes. It's a common way for people to look at valuation. Your statements today contradict that P.E. ratio is being high, create a problem for our market. Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, great point. I mean, you said, Ryan, what are your two worries this year? I would say valuations are a little stretched near term. OK, also inflation. I kind of talked about inflation already. If you look at um. Oops, definitely on something down there. If you look at PE multiples, they are some of the highest levels they've been in a while. At the same time, we think, again, the E part, there's the P part, that's the price, the E part of PE multiples. We think the E part is going to do a lot better than what people think, and that's likely in there. At the same time, you can't just talk about PE multiples being high in a vacuum. Guys, listen, the truth is rates are historically low. We're talking about a 1% 10 year yield. Inflation is still historically low. I'm, I know I've said inflation down the road is a worry of mine. It's still less than 2% last I checked. And when you have low inflation, when you have low rates, you also tend to have a higher PE multiple. Back in the early 80s, when we hit single digits in PEs, there was, oh, look how cheap stocks were in the early 80s. We got to get down to there before we want to buy again. And that's not our case at all, but I've heard that. Um, you know, we had massive inflation back then. So it kind of flip flops. So no inflation, low rates 
you're going to have higher PE multiples. And that, that kind of makes sense to us um, that maybe stocks aren't quite as overvalued right now as what some people think of when you see how low rates and again, how low inflation is. But clearly um, stocks are stretched here. Uh, clearly they are a little on the pricey side. I mentioned some of the big IPOs and things getting everyone all excited again. Those, those have me a little worried, um, but again, if you look back at history, a 10% correction, a 16% correction, like we saw in 2010, I think that'd be perfectly fine if that happened, you know, between now and say September, and then maybe you have the end of your rally that you tend to have. That'd be um, a healthy thing in our view. Excellent. We have heard people say, well, the counter to PE ratio concerns is the stock dividend to bond yield numbers. The stock dividends are quite right. a bit higher than bond yields. Is that a fair argument to make in terms of future opportunity? Yeah, we think so. I mean, you, you look at some of those things, and again, it says that stocks maybe, maybe stocks aren't so expensive. Maybe stocks are cheap when you compare them to bonds. I mean, you know, bonds are about as overvalued as they've ever been. All right, and again, it's, it's what's a uh, Tina, right? There is there is no other alternative. Um, I don't, I'm not that clear cut on it, but but still, that's an argument that's out there. That you know, do you really think for ten years making one percent? That's probably going to be less than inflation if you buy a ten-year ten-year bond here. Um, you know, in a likelihood, people will continue to go to stocks. Um, so we just think the major major trends again are stocks will likely continue to outperform bonds, and and stocks. Um, when you look at it relative to bonds, maybe they're not quite as overvalued as it looks like if all you saw was the PE multiple. Great point. Excellent. I've got a question from Dave. Dave says, "What market sectors may retract yep. and or expand with yeah. the new administration?" Yeah. Well, first let me let me do it like this. In 2016, after President Trump won, everyone said, you know what? He hates Jeff Bezos and Jeff Bezos hates him. Trump's gonna go after tech, tech's gonna do terrible. Financial, steel, and coal are gonna do awesome. Four years later, the exact opposite happened, okay? Technology continued to do well. Financials didn't do so well. Steel and coal did, did, didn't do so well either. But with all of that said, you know, we think one of the big potential, win two, two potential winners with Joe Biden, and even maybe you could add the, uh, the blue wave that we saw with the Georgia uh, runoffs, is financials and healthcare. All right. Financials likely continued higher, uh, a little more stimulus, a little higher yield. Like I talked about, financials could do um, could do pretty well from that. And healthcare in general, um, with the divide in government or the, the sorry, the the the, um, the, the, um, the small majority in the government, we think healthcare could be another area as well. I'll tell you, biotech, biotech stocks went nowhere for five years. All of a sudden, they're breaking out a big part, obviously, of, um, of health care. And we think that's a group that, that can do continue to do very well. And those should benefit. Now, the other one, you know, green energy is the obvious one. I mean, green energy stocks, if you guys look at those, those have gone crazy. They was the stock markets bet on potentially a Joe Biden win because they did so well ahead of the election. So it makes sense. A lot of it's priced in. I mean, clearly, there's going to be a lot of money coming for green energy and traditional energy, you know, uh, oil crude. I mean, in theory, I guess you could say Joe Biden shouldn't be is positive for those groups, but all of a sudden energy stocks are finally interestingly starting to bounce and crude oil is back above 50 bucks a barrel for the first time in a while. So again, I think it comes down to just follow the fundamentals. Um, you know, LPL Research, we've got a blog, lplresearch.com, our podcast, LPL Market Signals. You know, we 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 got a weekly um um, um weekly market commentary uh, that you can go to lpl.com to read what I'm getting at. I'm not trying to be a promo for LPL, but there's a lot of different these things change, these cycles change. Back in 2016, everybody, again, didn't like technology when Trump won. And sure enough, that was a great sector. So it's not so clear cut. If we're all talking about it, some of it's probably priced in. Um, but at the bottom, put a bow on this. I can go forever. You know, we think maybe more even uh, growth in value, right? We like technology. We like communication services over here. On this side of things, on the value side, we like industrials, materials, and financials. And then right in the middle is healthcare. Healthcare is kind of a little bit of both. We think those are some groups that we don't have to pick a favorite. It's like your kids, right? Some days you got a favorite, believe me. <laughs> and we all know that. But for the most part, you don't want to have a favorite. And there are a lot of potential winners here over the next four years and even out. But even for 2021, we, that's how we're positioning our models or starting to at least. Excellent. I got one last question as we wrap up, and that is we all probably have the likes of uh, technology in our portfolio. Many of us understand that the S&P was pretty much driven by technology stocks. Is yep. the boom over? We don't think so. I mean, technology's had an unbelievable run. There's no doubt about it. That's still where the earnings are coming from. I mean, tech stocks, they, they had nearly positive earnings last year. We had an earnings recession. Um, yes, they are move, they moved high. Yes, in a lot of ways, they're a little pricey. Then you've got all the news that's coming on with, you know, uh, with, with communication stocks, some of the potential issues they might have, um, you know, for, from the left and from the right, honestly. Uh, but, but we still think, you know, we'd be 
even weight technology here. We were overweight technology last year. We'd be even weight. There's 11 S&P 500 sectors when all is said and done a year from now or so. We think technology will still probably be in the top five. Will it be number one or two? Probably not, but it can still be an, uh, an outperformer. And we still think tech uh, can have a, a nice place in, in people's portfolios. Absolutely. Very good, Ryan. Well, I think I speak for everybody on the um, on the presentation today on the webinar. Thank you so much for your wisdom, your in insight, um, your advice and your guidance. Uh, we all appreciate it very much and uh, wish you a good year. No, well, same to you. I mean, I'm honored you guys had me. I mean, 17, it took you 17 tries to get to me, but that's okay. Better late than never. <laughs> but no, I mean, you guys are all in, <clears throat> excuse me, I get, I get choked up just talking about this. You guys are all in really good hands with Peter. And if there's anything that I can do, reach out to him. LPL Research is here to help as well. So hopefully, Peter, have a great year. I'm, I'm a phone call or email away. You know that. So just, um, you know, have fun with Bert next month. Maybe we'll end it with that. Enjoy Bert next time. <laughs> Very good. Thank you again, Ryan. Take care. All right. See you guys. Bye-bye. Take care. Thanks.